show you how I commission a tractor and now you may want to look at this video several times because I'm I've tried to make sure when I deliver a tractor to that customer he knows everything about it I don't expect him to remember it but he can call me and uh, or send me a text and I'm going to get back to him as quick as possible so on this tractor here when I deliver a tractor I'm going to deliver this one today and I'm gonna to try to provide more videos for y'all, but I always raise the loader up so I have easy access to do a, a uh, commissioning of the tractor. So what I do here, I'm gonna go ahead and move this forward. And then when you open the hood, your latch is here. You wanna pop down on it hard and then go ahead and raise the hood. You just can't just, you wanna give it some energy when you jerk down on that ring. Okay, so what I tell customers is that on a TYM tractor, this rule, this applies to all TYM tractors, and what I'm going to tell you about this T394 can also apply to the T354 because it has the same engine. It's got a Yanmar engine in it. The Yanmar is a 3TN V88, and uh, it's got, uh, it's a three-cylinder diesel. Uh, it's very well known. It's a very strong engine. But what I want you to know here on a TYM tractor, wherever you see yellow, is a lubrication oil checkpoint. Now, in the front axle, we have 80W90 or a GL5 lubricant, gear oil. In the engine, your dipstick is right here. Maybe it can shine down in there. Now it's, it's not that easy to get to, but what I do is that I run my arm down behind the loader frame and then I'll pull it out. And then you can kind of look down here by, in front of the loader frame and you can see where to stab it back in. So engine oil goes there. A, I like to use a premium engine oil. Don't go to Walmart and buy 15W40 because if you have an engine oil related failure, the lady behind the uh, customer service counter is not going to know why your engine oil foamed up. So go buy Rotella, Dello, Mobile, buy a name brand oil because if you have an engine oil related failure, they will buy you a new engine. Back here at the back, David. Let's get down low to the ground. Now, Back here is a sight glass, and you can see our oil level is right at the mid mark. So I want you to know that uh, you use a premium hydraulic oil if you, I don't want to promote tractor supply, but that's a place to get it. Um, but a premium hydraulic oil, do not use 303. 303 is for tractors made before 1973. But a premium hydraulic oil and that viscosity is like a 10W30, but that's what you want to use in this tractor. Now, this oil level here can change with the loader being up or down a little bit. It can also change with temperature. So when you check that sight glass, make sure that you're on a level spot, loader is down on the ground. Now, be aware that if you can't see it, doesn't necessarily mean that it's empty. It could be too high and you don't want to overfill the transmission because what will happen is uh, you'll overheat your oil. Is the fuel, primary fuel filter, fuel water separator, and your secondary fuel filter. You have this ring in here. This is your electric fuel pump right here. So what you want to do is periodically watch this, make sure no water gets in there. If it gets water, you want to drain this water off because this fuel system will not handle water. You want to make sure that your fuel is clean. This is red diesel. Red diesel is non-taxed. Your clear diesel that you buy at a convenience store, wherever you get your fuel, will be clear or a green or a blue color. Uh, that's what. This is not a special diesel fuel. We buy ours in bulk and that's why it's red. Uh, like I said, under here is this valve. Open it, let the water drain off your filter. 
and uh, close it and uh, keep on going. But you want to watch this carefully. Now, when you're mowing, if you're running a rotary cutter on a tractor, really dirty, dusty conditions, uh, if whatever, if it's your mowing, whatever, this screen here, you want to pull it out and clean it. Now, this information also applies to the uh, cab tractors, the 394 cab unit. The only thing that you got to watch with the 394 is that you have an additional cooler here, which is your condenser. And what that condenser does is for your AC system. What we've noticed is that the AC will start getting or start depleting because it's plugging off and air can't get through it to cool the refrigerant before it goes up through the evaporator. So what I like to do is get one of those skinny ones and I blow air from the back of the shroud forward and I clean that out. Do not use a pressure washer. Do not use a garden hose unless everything is completely clean but you want to take things apart. You may have to take part of the shroud off and get that one in there and clean that out good. Uh, you want to do that after you mow each and every time. You want the radiator and you want your condenser clean. If you have hot refrigerant going through a compressor, it'll eventually fail. So keep all this clean when you're in a really, really dirty environment. Now this tractor here has a drawbar. I need to let you know that when you connect a rotary cutter to this tractor, take this pin out here and shove this all the way forward or take it out and put it someplace where you know where it's at. This drawbar is used to pull an implement. You can pull, I wouldn't be afraid to pull a 10 foot tandem disc with this tractor. If you have any kind of a pull type attachment, uh, you may want to pull a small trailer with it. Um, there may be some other, it, you know, we, we sell hay equipment to fit these tractors. You may want to hook a baler onto this tractor, but that's what that draw bar is for. Now, when I'm connecting the three point hitch, what I do, I make sure the tractor is in neutral. And what I'll do is I'll lower my three point hitch and I will get into, I will, I will connect these first. Get the pins started onto the, uh, the lift pins on the rotary cutter or whatever I'm using. I will kind of push this forward and that will help these lift arms slide onto the, uh, the lift pins because when you rotate these, the distance changes. So if you get them started, just rock this back and forth and that will help you get the, uh, the lift arms onto your lift pins. And then once you connect this, connect your PTO shaft. We have a patented PTO adapter you can get. Connect your PTO shaft and then this. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the three-point hitch again, uh, hydraulic system on this tractor. Uh, your three-point hitch control is right here by the seat. Forward is down, back is up. But a lot of people don't realize what this valve is for here. This is called the slow return valve. So what I do, I always, when I deliver this, I'll take this and I'll open it one full turn when I deliver the tractor. And what this slow return does is that it, con it controls the speed in which your implement drops. So if you have a rotary cutter on the back of your tractor with the tail wheel, you don't want your rotary cutter to just fall out of sight. You want it to slowly come down to the ground. Now once your rotary cutter tail wheel hits, you want to adjust your, your top link and your three point hitch right here to where your rotary cutter is about two inches off the ground and your tail wheel and the three point hitch is supporting the mower. Don't, don't run your rotary cutter with the rails, the side rails on the ground. Don't drag it. Keep it off the ground. It does a better job of mowing and uh, your blades will last longer. You won't break a shear bolt as easy or you won't burn up slip clutches.
to talk about the PTO connection. I like to have this tractor with the lever off, and then if it's off, it makes it easier to turn the shaft on the back of the tractor to help line up your splines to get your PTO shaft onto the tractor. Once you get it, your PTO shaft connected, go ahead and push this lever back. It doesn't move very far, so it just it's not going to move a foot and a half. It just moves very little, but that disconnects your PTO to help you line up the splines to stab it. Now, David, I'll shine over here for me, please. Right here is your on-off button for the PTO. Do not touch this unless the tractor is in the idle position. That's the throttle all the way up. You don't ever want to pull your tractor to full throttle and push that button because whatever's connected to the PTO shaft could break because you have a, a, a big power surge. So what you want to do whenever you press that button, that engine's at idle. Now on your tachometer here, you see this yellow indicator that says PTO on it. Now what PTO means is two things. Power takeoff speed is at 540 RPM, which is the common RPM for a lot of implements built in the United States. The other PTO means peak torque overload and at that speed your engine is producing maximum amount of torque. So I'm going to let you know that if you're operating your tractor and you're pulling a tillage tool, run your tractor at full throttle and keep increasing your speed until the tachometer is slightly below that PTO indicator, that means your engine is producing adequate heat to be most efficient and it also is producing the most power. Whenever you're pulling the tillage tool with this tractor, full throttle. Whenever you're pulling something that is PTO driven, PTO speed is indicated on the tachometer. Now I want to add something on this, your PTO control here. Remember that whenever you push this button, the tractor is always at idle because if you don't you're going to break something so this switch here that has off manual and auto what this does is that if you're in the auto position whenever you raise the three-point hitch back here it shuts off your PTO so if you have a an implement with a short PTO shaft like a tiller like a flail mower or a rear mounted pit post hole digger auto may be a good thing for you because it protects the drive shaft from being damaged because of a steep angle whenever you raise that three point hitch up the angle of your PTO shaft increases and you're allowed 35 degrees if you exceed 35 degrees you can damage your drive line so it's a good thing to have this uh, I put it in manual when I deliver it because usually people uh, just have a rotary cutter and uh, they know it's going to work whenever they push this red button. So that's what it's for. Just remember that if your PTO does not work, make sure you're in manual and not in the off position. This is a basic seat on a T394. What you want to do in order to slide it forward is to pull this lever up and move forward and move back and then your steering wheel does tilt. What I tell people to do is rest their hand up here, pull the lever and then pull it down in the position that you like. And then pull the lever up, push the steering wheel up until you get in a position that you like. But this is your tilt wheel here. Nice little feature the tractor has. Also over here is a uh, area to uh, a plug to charge your cell phone, a place to put your cell phone, a beverage, and a pocket for miscellaneous things that you may need to keep with you on the track. I want to let you know on a, a 39, this 394, uh, if you have uh, all in four wheel drive, it will do a lot of work. 
it's unbelievable what these tractors will do if you hold the tires. Um, what I'm going to tell you, you, you want to remember because you have three ranges. On this tractor, wherever you see orange, has to do with speed and direction. There's no other orange anywhere, but your other two AMs have orange. You got low, medium, and high. Here's your throttle. And you also have an auto throttle button here, which means whenever you push the forward pedal forward, the engine RPM increases as well. Now, if you're running a rotary cutter on the back and you have to have constant RPM on the PTO, you use your hand throttle. But if you're using the loader and you need power on command, go to auto throttle. I don't recommend that you run a PTO driven implement with your auto throttle on, leave it off. But I also wanted to tell you that when you're running the tractor, you're working with the tractor, whether it's mowing, whether it's using the loader, you have it in low range. Don't put it in medium range. Don't put it in high range. It's always low range. For safety reasons, what I tell people is that if you are in two-wheel drive and you lift something with the loader and it doesn't move, it's too heavy. Don't go to four-wheel drive and try to move a heavy load because all you're doing, you're exceeding the capacity of the tractor. So I think it's best to leave everything. When you're running the loader, it's good to have four-wheel drive for safety reasons, but whenever you're working, if you are mowing, if you are using the loader, if you're going to unload something with pallet forks on the front of the tractor, low range. Medium range is to get across the field at a higher speed, high range, is for highway. Whenever you're operating the tractor in medium range or high range, two-wheel drive. Now your two-wheel drive or your four-wheel drive control is right here to the left of the seat. And I want to let you know that if you have difficulty getting it to go in and out, what you do is drive straight, drive slow, hold pressure on the knob and it'll fall in or hold up pressure on it and it will come up. What you're doing, you're lining those gears up, and then it'll just come right in, and in, in, uh, it'll, it'll go ahead and uh, engage. Right here is a differential lock. Now, what that does, if you are in a situation where you're going through uneven terrain, you have a loader with something heavy on the front, and as you go forward or backwards, you'll feel the load shift and one tire will get light. It may spin freely and you stop there. If you're going through uneven terrain, running the loader, keep your heel on this just to be safe and go straight. That makes sure that both wheels operate at the same speed. The other thing is that if you need the additional traction, you're in a wet area and you're trying to pull something through a wet area and one tire speeds that spins faster than the other, hold that down and that will give you more traction. Basically it's positive track. So you want to keep your heel on that if you have any doubt that you're going to lose traction. Now up here on the front I want to talk to you about the DPF system, the diesel particle filter, the regen system. When what you want to do, you want to operate your engine with, with a minimum of 1500 RPM. Don't, don't let it idle unless you, it's real cold in the morning. You want to go outside, you fire it up, you let it idle. We go back in the house, have a cup of coffee, come back out. But let it idle there a few minutes to let it warm up. But when you're doing loader work, minimum 1500 RPM. When you are, if, when you are doing anything like connecting implements, you got to idle back you gotta, uh, slowly, you got to move slow, minimum of 1500 RPM. After about 40 hours on this screen here, when you turn the screen on, it won't show up now, but you're going to see a regen indicator. It's on page, it's in your manual, it's 2.8 I think. And uh, what you want to do is, once this indicates over here that it wants you to regen, you'll see this light come on right here. And what that does, you want to press and hold that for a couple of seconds. But before you do that, park and brake on, and everything, tractor in neutral, 
PTO off, and then press the button. Once that happens, it will speed up to about 2200 RPM for about 30 minutes until it's cleaned out, and then it'll idle back down. We don't see it very often on Yanmar. We don't see it very often on the Coupe J. But if you run the engine, don't let it idle uh, forever. You won't see it very often. Maybe every 40 hours is what we're hearing out there. But it's something that's not very that's not seen much. Now, when you turn your key on, you'll see this indicator. Here it says start check. Once you put your foot on the brake, it goes away and the engine's ready to start. You cannot start the tractor unless you rest your foot on the brakes here. You got to push down on the brake before you can turn the key. Once that happens, it's just kind of like a car. You know, you got to put the brake on before you pull it down in gear, uh, drive, reverse, whatever. Same thing here, except it will not start unless the brakes are on. Um, your lights here is on this black knob. And what you have is your left turn signal, right turn signal, low and high beam, and a horn. Now your, your turn signals are back here and you also have brake lights. When the key's on, you do have that, just FYI. Your fuel tank is approximately seven, almost eight gallons. And you do have a screen in here so make sure you watch that that's a good thing and I also wanted to tell you that if you're watching the fuel gauge while filling it the fuel gauge reacts slow which means if you fill it up all the way in let's say two minutes your fuel indicator on the panel may still show half full it doesn't really go up very fast so don't panic it's just a sl it reacts slow on your T394, you've got a little toolbox here. So just for linchpins, stuff like that, I like to use one of those magnetic trays you get out of a parts store. And I'll stick a magnetic tray here or back here on the back and throw my linchpins up in it. That works real good too. I wanna to talk to you about loader control here. And now remember, you keep your RPM at 1500 RPM. You can also have your auto throttle button on. But you have a float position on your loader control and you have some other indicators on this loader. When you are, when you get a load of gravel, dirt, whatever, and you want to smooth it out, what you do is rotate your bucket to where this rod is about an inch and a half down into the tube or two inches. And once you, you start back dragging over your material, put this in the float position. That locks forward, and once you do that, it allows the, the uh, loader to float to the contour of the surface. When it does that, it looks like you took a concrete trial over your material and smoothed it out. Don't try to try to work it back. Put this in the float position and back up and you'll be amazed of how smooth everything is going to look. It's going to look very well and you're going to be, everybody's going to brag about you how good it looks. Now, also on your loader, if you are trying to do something quick, you have two position dump. So this is slow and if you want to increase the speed of your dump, go past the stop and you'll see your speed increase on your bucket tilt. So that's all it does, it just increases the flow to your bucket to speed it up, to the dumping process. It doesn't do it on the tilt back, it does only on the tilt forward. But implement your flow position whenever you get a chance. It's good to, I like when I shut the tractor off, I make sure that I rotate this all the right way around. My three-point hitch is all the way down. So I have no energy anywhere in the system. When I rotate this around, all of my energy in the hydraulic system is neutralized. My energy in the three-point hitch is neutralized. And I don't have, uh, it, it just eliminates stress on your hoses, on your valves and eliminates any kind of a possible leak if the tractor's been sitting a long time, get the pressure off of it.
it will uh, it will be a good friend if you do that. On your loader, you have this tab, and that locks it. So, if you if you are working on your lo on your tractor and you had the loader in the air, lock this forward, and nobody can get on the tractor and then move this forward and bring the loader down on top of you while you're working on it. On the front here, make sure that you always have this upper back if when you have the loader down because this here uh, cross member will come down and hit it and bend things so make sure this is always back towards the hood whenever you up or raise the loader up and down what I wanted to tell you is how to get the bucket off the tractor and what I mean not the loader frame but the bucket itself I wouldn't be afraid to put a good set of pallet forks on this tractor I have a 354 that we use pallet forks on around the yard and we use it all the time for a lot of things. They're handy as the pocket on your shirt. But whenever you're disconnecting the bucket, have it slightly off the ground or on the ground, and you basically raise these levers up until they're all the way out of the way. And then you want to get both of them up. And then slowly, as you back away from your bucket, hold downward pressure on the um, on your loader control and once the two are separated go do what you want but keep yourself in a safe position whenever you disconnect these don't have the loader way off the ground if if there's some reason that you cannot put it on the ground sit back here and disconnect your levers because you don't want to be here because something could fall off and and, and hit you so always be in this position when uh, you are uh, disconnecting the bucket on the loader. Now, these loaders are strong. Just remember it's a loader, not a digger. So, if the loaders can lift quite a bit, that's what they're designed to do. But don't try to push too much with it because you will bend something. So, if, if, you, are, if you have to push something, make sure that your load is in the center don't try to push on a corner because what will happen, you will bend something. So just keep that in mind. Now, you can see the bucket is flat on our floor here. And what helps you understand or figure out the position of your bucket is this, this tube and this rod. As you tilt the bucket, this rod will go up and down in this tube, but when the two are flush with each other, the bucket is flat on the ground and what's good about that is that if you get a load of gravel in your yard or whatever in your yard you know that your bucket's flat on the ground so you can get this material in there once you feel resistance as you're driving forward stop rotate your bucket all the way back and lift your boom and back out you won't be digging below the surface now if you get pallet forks you can still adjust this to where you know the pellets are level. You may have to adjust this periodically with some kind of an implement on the front. But this is what this is for. It's an indicator to tell you the angle in which your implement on the front end is. Now, to disconnect your loader, what you do is make sure that you have the bucket on the tractor. Have the bucket off the ground about two feet to three feet and lower your legs on both sides. Lower it back down to the ground and what you do then is remove the pins on both sides. Once you remove the pins on both sides, you have your legs down, you have a bucket. Don't attempt this without pallet forks or a bucket. Once you're on the ground, what you do is operate your loader until this basically kicks up. And what you'll do is you, you roll your bucket back and the weight of the bucket, the weight of the system, this will pop up. Once it pops up, back up two or three inches where the two are separated and shut your tractor off and then orbit your loader control valve to neutralize all the pressure. Always orbit this to make sure there's no pressure on the system. You can see that my loader is still wanting to move. So I have no pressure on the system. 
until nothing, until everything stops moving, now I'm ready to disconnect these hydraulic couplers. Did you shine over here, David? Now these are color coded. You have to go over the top. Here. There we go. So right here, these are color coded. Just separate them. Pull this sleeve back. And then once you go back together with it, just pop it in until the sleeve moves forward. But if you have pressure on the system, these are going to be very difficult to get reconnected. So whenever you disconnect, start with your top, work your way down. When you reconnect, start with your bottom and work your way up. Just makes it easier if you decide to take the loader off. A lot of people don't ever take their loaders off for whatever reason. But if you're going to mow and you want a, what I call a clean tractor, you can pop your loader off. As long as you're on a good level hard surface, they're not difficult to get off. If you bend something, these pins are going to be held to get out. So just let you know. But right now, these just they're not hard to get off as long as you're on a good level surface and you take care of your loader. I want to talk to you about maintenance on this tractor. The first 50 hours, what you need to do is change your front axle oil, your engine oil, and if you have a hydrostatic drive, your hydrostatic drive filter. Your hydrostatic drive filter is up underneath in the middle of the transmission. When you unscrew that filter, make sure that you pull that gasket off with it because if you screw a new filter on there, that gasket will stay and you'll pump a whole bunch of oil on the ground. So when you unscrew your filter, make sure that gasket comes with it. Use uh, TYM filters for your tractor while it's under warranty. You're only protecting yourself. Don't try to buy an aftermarket filter because there's none out there. So make sure that you use good oil. Now, as far as front axle, just go to a good, reliable auto parts place to get your oil. Um, and get you a GL5. Let your oil down at the bottom of your hubs. You got a drain plug at the bottom down there. Wherever you see yellow, you see this plug here. Let your oil drain overnight. So get you a piece of cardboard and channel the oil to a drain pan and let these drain overnight. You'll need about three to four gallons to fill this front axle up. So at 50 hours, it's critical that you change the oil in this front axle, your engine oil, and your hydrostatic drive filter. Always check your your uh, your uh, your your filters, your fuel filters. Remember to do that, and your air cleaner periodically. Blow it out. Grease your loader every 50 hours. After you do your first 50 hours on your engine, it's every 250 after that. So. At 250, it's again your engine oil only. Make sure you grease your loader. And then you got grease fittings up underneath the tractor where your pedals are. So look there for grease fittings. Get you a number two grease. That's what I like. But don't buy a cheap grease. Buy a good grease when you grease your tractor. Uh, the, uh, the, the loader, once again, every 50 hours, make sure you wipe your fittings off with a paper towel or a rag. Clean this area out and grease these until you hear it or you see it. But right to the right of your dipstick is your engine oil filter and further to the right is your oil filler plug. That's where you put oil in the engine for your T394 or T354. Use a pre-mixed coolant 50-50 green coolant for your tractor. Don't pour straight antifreeze in and then top off with water from the garden hose because mineral deposits get in and cause problems with the cooling system. The hydrostatic drive oil filter on the T394 is right in the center. Now on a 354, it's up underneath in the middle of the transmission. All right, when your 
if you need hydraulic oil for the rear axle, what it is is right here is where you fill it up. You have to get you one of them long transmission funnels and fill that up. Put your little oil in there right there. That's all you need to, that's where you fill your hydraulic oil. When greasing your front axle on your TYM tractor, this applies for your uh, Oh, 574 on down to your, uh, maybe the 234. This grease fitting here, and then there's one on the back side of the axle. Back there on the other side, you can barely see the grease coming down. Grease that every 50 hours. And when you put your grease gun on it, uh, you'll feel maybe resistance after the second or third pump, then stop right there. Don't, don't continue to pack grease into it and force the seal out.